Hello and welcome to today's A-Level RE Flip Learning Talk on Religious Language. Specifically, we're going to be looking at John Hick's idea of eschatological verification and the falsification principle put forward by Karl Popper and Anthony Flew. The idea of this talk is for you to listen, take notes if you wish to, and then respond to the retrieval questions afterwards. You can stop and replay this at any time to make sure that you understand what it is I'm talking about. And I'm going to assume that you have some prior knowledge of philosophy. But beware, there are quite a lot of technical terms which we'll need to look at closely to ensure that we understand what's being said. In my previous podcast, I talked about the impact logical positivism, and in particular, Ayer's verification principle, had on religious language. As you'll remember, according to Ayer's strong version of the principle, religious truth claims were dismissed as being entirely meaningless, as they were neither analytic nor synthetic statements. Ayer modified his verification principle to allow statements where we have sufficient evidence to make it probable, or where we know the criteria needed to verify it, even if we can't currently do so, for historical statements or for statements about the future. And it was this modification, this weak verification principle, which opened the door and allowed religious philosophers like John Hick to claim this meant religious statements could indeed still be regarded as being factually significant. Hick argued that religious statements could be verified in the future, when we die. Hick's approach is called eschatological verification. Eschatology is to do with end times and last judgment, and it's here we're going to pick up the debate. For this talk, I have relied heavily on the philosophy and focus book Philosophy of Religion by Jones, Cardinal and Hayward, which for this area of religious language in particular is excellent. Like Ayer and the Vienna Circle, Hick agreed that only factually verifiable statements are meaningful. However, unlike Ayer, Hick maintains that religious truth claims can be verified. There are three main aspects to his approach, which we'll look at individually. Firstly, Hick's definition of verification. This differs to Ayer's in that the significance of a statement is judged by whether the truth or falsity of it, that is, whether it's true or false, makes a difference to our experience of the world. The example given in Jones, Cardinal and Hayward is of there being an invisible, odourless and intangible rabbit in the room. Whether that may statement is true or false makes no difference to our experience of the room. If it's invisible, odourless and intangible, then it doesn't matter if it's here or not. Not only can this statement not be verified empirically, its truth or falsity won't affect us. Therefore, according to Hick, in order for a statement to have meaning, it must have some kind of impact on our experience. Secondly, Hick picks up on Ayer's claim that if statements can potentially be verified, then they can still be regarded as meaningful. He proposes that statements are eschatologically verifiable. Hick illustrates his argument by using a story which is known as the parable of the celestial city. We're going to look at a few philosophical parables in this talk. They're really just ways of illustrating a point being made. I'm going to read you an extract from Hick's book, Theology and Verification, published in 1960, in which he says, Two people are travelling together along a road. One of them believes that it leads to the celestial city, the other that it leads nowhere. But since this is the only road there is, both must travel it. Neither has been this way before, therefore neither is able to say what they will find around each corner. During their journey they meet with moments of refreshment and delight, and with moments of hardship and danger. All the time one of them thinks of the journey as a pilgrimage to the celestial city. She interprets the pleasant parts as encouragements and the obstacles as trials of her purpose and lessons in endurance, prepared by the sovereign of that city and designed to make of her a worthy citizen of the place when at last she arrives. The other, however, believes none of this and sees their journey as an unavoidable and aimless ramble. Since he has no choice in the matter, he enjoys the good and endures the bad. For him, there is no celestial city to be reached, no all-encompassing purpose ordaining their journey. There is only the road itself, 
and the luck of the road in good weather and in bad. When they turn the last corner, it will be apparent that one of them has been right all the time, and the other wrong. In other words, according to Hick, religious statements are meaningful and verifiable because they'll be verified when we die. The third aspect of Hick's approach is to do with personal identity after death. Clearly, if I am to verify that heaven, God, angels, etc. do exist, then I'm going to have to retain my own body, that is, eyes, brain, mind, memory, etc., in order to be able to do that. Hick presents what's called his replica theory in order to argue that the resurrection of the body is a perfectly reasonable proposition and therefore eschatological verification is possible. Hick's replica theory forms an important part of philosophy of religion modules about life after death and it's tempting to go off on a bit of a tangent here to discuss the coherence of it. However, we're talking about verification and religious language and so I'll stay focused on the task in hand. I urge you to do the same if you're using Hick in an essay about verification. Don't talk too much about life after death. Try practice referencing his ideas in one sentence to sign post your knowledge but without getting distracted. One major logical flaw in Hick's eschatological verification, which he acknowledges, is that statements can only be verified. They can't be falsified. That is, they can't be proven to be false. After all, if there is no God, no heaven, no angels, etc. when I die, then I just die and that's it. I'm not going to be able to say, oops, sorry, looks like I was wrong after all, because I'll just be dead. This leads us into the second strand of today's talk about falsification. And this involves identifying what would make a statement false. The falsification principle was proposed by the scientific philosopher Karl Popper, Although Popper was never really a member of the Vienna Circle, he worked closely with some of the people who were, and he said no theory can ever be proven to be 100% true. Therefore, for a hypothesis, and for Popper he was talking about scientific hypotheses, to be meaningful, it must be able to be proven false. If things are falsifiable, then they can be used in scientific studies and inquiries. He said, the scientific status of a theory is its falsifiability, refutability or testability. So take the hypothesis, all swans are white, for example. This is not verifiable because it would be impossible to absolutely and conclusively be certain that every single swan in the world is white. However, you only need to find one swan that isn't white in order to falsify the statement. Therefore, scientific statements still have meaning if they're falsifiable, but not verifiable. In his 1955 article entitled Theology and Falsification, the British philosopher Anthony Flew dismissed religious statements as meaningless because believers will not accept any evidence which would make it false. Flew differs from the logical positivists in two main ways. Firstly, because he depends on falsification rather than verification to decide if a statement is meaningful or not. And secondly, flu doesn't require proof, but demands that we know what kind of evidence would make us rejected as false, if we could imagine what would make us wrong. He adapts a story originally put forward in 1944 by the British philosopher John Wisdom in an article entitled Gods, which is called The Parable of the Gardener. I'll read it to you. Once upon a time, two explorers came upon a clearing in the jungle. In the clearing were growing many flowers and many weeds. One explorer says, some gardener must tend this plot. The other disagrees, there is no gardener. So they pinched their tents and set a watch. No gardener is ever seen, but perhaps he's an invisible gardener. So they set up a barbed wire fence. They electrify it. They patrol it with bloodhounds, for they remember how H.G. Wells's The Invisible Man could be both smelt and touched, though he couldn't be seen. But no shrieks ever suggest that some intruder has received a shock. 
no movements of the wire ever betray an invisible climber. The bloodhounds never give a cry, yet still the believer is not convinced. But there is a gardener, invisible, intangible, insensible to electric shocks, a gardener who has no scent and makes no sound, a gardener who comes secretly to look after the garden which he loves. At last the sceptic despairs. But what remains of your original assertion? Just how does what you call an invisible, intangible, eternally elusive gardener differ from an imaginary gardener or even from no gardener at all? According to Flew, therefore, the definition of gardener has been redefined to such an extent that it no longer has any meaning. According to Flew, religious believers cause God to die the death of a thousand qualifications. They are continually moving the goalposts or modifying their beliefs so they're compatible with any state of affairs. Can't see him? or well, he's invisible. Can't feel him? He's, he's intangible. No evidence of him? or oh, he's transcendent. So Flew is asking how such a God differs from an imaginary God or even from no God at all. A similar pattern can be identified in the way believers may approach the biblical story of creation. This was traditionally taken as being literally true. God created the world in six days and formed man out of the earth. However, modern cosmology and evolutionary theory cast serious doubts on the literal truth of this account. So, as a consequence, many believers now say this is sacred myth. They've qualified their belief to accommodate modern scientific explanations. They may say that God directed evolution or that God was the prime mover, the first cause of the universe. What Flew would want though, in order to make this claim meaningful, is to acknowledge what kind of evidence would make it false. Not just constantly redefine God to accommodate scientific developments. Flew presents the statement which is common in Christianity where believers claim that God loves them as a father loves his children. He asks how much evil and suffering must exist in the world before believers will accept that either God doesn't exist or that their belief that God loves them is false. Believers will endlessly qualify their belief despite the evidence in front of them by claiming that God is testing them or punishing them or offering them opportunities for self-improvement. However, according to Flew, their claim that God loves them has no meaning because it's consistent with any given state of affairs. Philosophers have offered lots of examples to illustrate this, normally involving stalkers and unrequited love, but I think it's fairly straightforward so I'm not going to get distracted by those. Instead, I'm going to look specifically at two criticisms of Flew's falsification principle. The first one comes from Basil Mitchell. Mitchell claims that religious statements can be regarded as both verifiable and falsifiable. He says Flew is wrong to say that believers don't accept evidence that may count against their beliefs. Indeed, having a crisis of faith or serious doubts in the existence of God as a result of trauma or suffering is very common among believers. He also presents a parable to illustrate this, the third of four parables that we're looking at today. Mitchell's parable is called The Partisan and the Stranger and it tells of a resistance fighter who at times you see fighting against the enemy and at other times you see fighting for it. And despite having doubts, you decide to put your trust in them and believe that the stranger really is on your side. Now, this reflects many believers' experiences, including that of Job in the Bible, who despite everything that happens to him, losing his house, his health, his family and his friends, claims in chapter 19, verse 25, I know that my Redeemer liveth. So, according to Mitchell, the belief that the stranger is loyal to the resistance movement is meaningful because it's falsifiable. You can easily recognise the circumstances which would make you give up your belief. Indeed, it's the trials of faith experienced by believers which make their claims falsifiable. In addition, Mitchell also believes that one day the truth will be revealed in the parable when the war is over or like Hick when we die. 
This means that for Mitchell, the claim God exists is both verifiable and falsifiable. Our final contribution and parable for today comes from R.M. Hare and his idea of Blix. For Hare, Flew has misunderstood the significance of religious statements and what makes them true or false. Indeed, for Hare, the meaning of religious statements comes from the way in which they underpin our experience of life. To illustrate his point, Hare presents the parable of the paranoid student, where he says, A certain lunatic is convinced that all dons, that is, university lecturers, want to murder him. His friends introduce him to all the mildest and most respectable dons they can find, and after each of them has retired, they say, You see, he doesn't really want to murder you. He spoke to you in a most cordial manner. Surely you're convinced now. But the lunatic replies, Yes, but that was only his diabolical cunning. He's really plotting against me the whole time, like the rest of them. I know it, I tell you. However many kindly dons are produced, the reaction is still the same. So, like the person who believes in the invisible gardener, the paranoid student can't imagine being wrong. However, Hare argues that his belief still has meaning because it has a profound influence on the way in which the student approaches the world. It forms the basis on which all his other experiences rest and dictates how he lives his life. So while it's true that it can't be falsified and that all the evidence becomes twisted to fit his beliefs that all the dons want to murder him, the centrality of his belief gives it meaning. According to Hare, therefore, we all have fundamental beliefs or principles on which we base our actions. They're neither verifiable nor falsifiable. And he coins the term blick, which is best understood as the lens through which we view or interpret and understand our experience. So if I'm religious, I will interpret a beautiful sunset as evidence of the bounteous creativity of the divine. Whereas if I'm an atheist, I'm likely to experience it as the wondrousness of nature. My blick colours and informs my experience of life. For Hare, therefore, the statement, the dons are trying to murder me, is meaningful to the paranoid student because it stems from his blick. It may be an insane blick and not one that you or I share, but nevertheless it remains meaningful to the student because it's in accordance with his own particular frame of reference. Religious statements can therefore be considered as meaningful. They resonate with an interpretation of how believers experience and understand the world and therefore they tell us something about them. For Hare, religious statements are not simply factual. Their meaning is rooted in the individual's framework of reference and it's manifested in the way it plays out in their life. So religious language therefore goes beyond the simple statement of facts and demonstrates deeper truths which are subjective and often specific to the individual. Now, as with the verification principle, the debate around falsification can be used in lots of ways. I mentioned life after death very briefly, but it also crops up when talking about religious experience. So again, it's well worth getting to grips with it. On the PowerPoint, you'll see the retrieval questions to accompany this talk, as well as the deeper and more broad ranging reflection questions for you to discuss in class. Thanks for listening.